Neil Armstrong about to step on the moon in 1969. I can still remember, a seven-year-old at the time, the images on the TV that we watched this the next day, actually. We went to a little local school, and they had all the kids there, and they, got us to, they gave us a chance to see this. We did not have a TV when I was a child. I grew up in a very poor family in a very rural part of Canada, and this, this simple scene, that one sentence, galvanized me to want to be something more, to be something much bigger than I was, to dream, dare to dream. And that's what we're going to talk about. I dare you to dream. The Jira Foundation presents this series called Navigating Research. Right. Many of you will recognize this character. This is William Shatner who played Captain Kirk in Star Trek. I can't remember which, which movie this is, but I just love that line. I only work in space. And as a kid, when I dreamt of being astrono an astronaut, I never, I never imagined myself as some kind of greater you know, superhero or something like that. No, no, no. I imagined myself as somebody physically working in space, whether it was building a worksta uh, workstation, a space station, or a colony on the moon or Mars. All of those things, I kind of imagined myself being a construction worker in space. Really, that's what I saw myself as, a construction worker in space. I grew up in a construction family. Most of my brothers and sisters, and I have 11 brothers and two sisters, most of them are in the construction industry. And when I come home for Christmas or visits, whatever, I always go to the job site with them, and I'm one of their laborers. I carry the stone around for them. Uh, I guess I have a strong back and, and a weak mind. But, but the bottom line is, is I always imagine myself as being a journeyman in space, not, not the, the hero. Nothing like that. It had nothing to do with fantastic journeys and, you know, and all this swashbuckling. No, 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 no. I imagined myself as a worker in space, a construction worker in space. And probably because, as I said, I grew up in a construction family. So uh, although I was imagining and dreaming, and I was dreaming bigger than myself, but I extended from what I knew to what I wanted to get to. Pretty simple, I guess. And that is what it's all about. How do you expand your imagination? How do you go beyond what you are to what you would like to be or what you think the most, the near impossible is? And, and that's the hard part. Anyways, in my case, I, I really enjoyed sci-fi because I got to see into the minds of others. Gene Roddenberry, in this case, was the creator of Star Trek. And so I got to see the imagination of Gene Roddenberry. The same is true for every movie you watch. Same is true for every production of anything. And then another example of where you can draw from for your imagination is nature. You can see how animals interact, how we interact with animals, just sitting by the beach, listening to the waves. All of this adds to your imagination, and, um, and it creates something in your head, and that will help you to dream bigger. And that's important. Dream bigger. Don't just dream. Dream big. This is what I wanted to do. Literally, working on Mars. Just parking off and looking at the night sky through the Martian atmosphere. And this is all the swashbuckling crap that you get out of Hollywood that what you might think might happen. This is not what I imagined. I mean, it would be cool. Can you imagine spacewalks? But no, no, this is, 
This is the Hollywood add-in to what I thought about. Kind of looks cool, don't it? But, you know, <laughs> anyways. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. Probably my favorite part, my favorite scene in the movie The Martian, right here. And he sciences the shit out of things. And uh, to be honest with you, this is kind of what I sort of imagine, this kind of thing. Like, you know, if you're a worker bee, if you're a worker in space, your job is basically to fix things. And you got to come up with solutions. And that's what NASA was really all about, finding solutions. And so, and same would be true as from the cosmonaut program and the Baikonaut program out of China and so on and so forth. But the reality is this is kind of what I imagined space would be like and how we would, we would work there. That's why I like this scene so much. It really just shows some creativity. This is Jeffrey Hoffman getting ready for a spacewalk. He was one of the several astronauts that fixed the Hubble telescope. I met this man. I, I was lucky enough to, to ferry him around South Africa for a series of talks on science and, 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 and the space program, etc. And of course, he was the main feature of all those presentations. There was a bunch of other astronomers with us, but I ferried him around various cities in South Africa. And uh, he told me one thing that he always took to, took to heart. He said, you have to see the space program as plan B in your life. So he wanted to be an astronaut, but it had to be as plan B. So he became an astronomer like I did. And, and here is Jeff Hoffman working in outer space. Literally what I was talking about. I dreamt of working in outer space. At present, he's at the end of the Canada arm. By the way, the second connection I have to the space program is the Canada arm. Because one of my friends designed that system. Out of, uh, he went to Queen's University. He and I were in grad school together. Okay, So I have two connections just in this picture alone. The, the astronaut and the Canada arm. I have no connection to the Hubble at all, and I've never used it, to be frank with you. Anyways, but this fixed it so they could see better. This is a man working in outer space. He's a glorified electrician. He went out there, disconnected things, and reconnected things. Put in new, took out old parts, put in new parts. He could be a television repairman, but uh, he's obviously a lot more than that, and this took a lot of training. But um, still, this is my idea of working in space. This is it. This is what I dreamt of when I talked about working in space. At least as a small child, this is what I saw myself doing. Doing this kind of thing. Fixing things. Building things. Nothing other than that. No swashbuckling. This image may be familiar to you. I, I used it in my... AVN story, the African VLBI network story. And in it, I was then working at the Department of Science and Technology, cut a long story very short, we, we dreamt up a telescope based on building a single dish in each partner country. Originally, they were just asking for test instruments, ones in which that, teach, that they could teach and train students on. And then I just realized that, hey, there's more that can be done with that. And I talked to a group of my friends at Hart Rail, and we all agreed it could do something, modest though it could be, because they would be small telescopes, but irrespective, it could do science. And, and that's how the idea was born, the African VLBI network. It was born of my, from my experiences working at Hart Rail and recognizing that this, would, this could be made into a network for very little cost. So that's a, that's a part of your imagination. You know, your experience feeds your ima imagination, and you come up with ideas like the African VLBI network. Another, another, <laughs> another uh, example of uh, expanding your imagination and dare to dream was the idea of doing astronomy on top of Kilimanjaro. Not at the peak itself, but at, on the saddle or on the secondary peak at Mowenzi. You can see it here in the distance. And again, this was an example of me working at the DST and receiving a delegation from Tanzania asking to get involved in the Square Kilometer A project. I knew that they couldn't be directly involved. We only had seven African partners, 
based on the design. So I came up with this simple answer for to the delegation from Tanzania and I said, well, why don't you simply build a telescope on top of the long, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world? And the Kilimanjaro telescope was born. But I'll show you something even more interesting and entertaining about this and crazier. When the Kilimanjaro project started getting real and we were going to present to the people who are responsible for the mountain itself, in other words, the ones have to give us the permission, which is the Ministry of Tourism rather than the Ministry of Science, we were pre they presented us with three issues, economical, ecological, and aesthetical. The first one is related directly to the climbers. So we could not do anything that would adversely affect the climbers because they generate about $50 million a year to the Tanzanian economy. Ecological is the environment and the bottom of the mountain is surrounded by a, a tropical rainforest which is a world heritage protected site. So again we have to be careful we don't affect that. We can't cut down trees. And aesthetical of course is the beauty of the mountain. Plain and simple it's a pristine mountain with very little development if we do anything and affect that beauty, it will go back and affect the ecology as well as the economy because fewer climbers will go up it and of course there's fewer trees and so on. So we got three big issues. We got a problem in our dream. This dream is coming to a serious crisis. We got to solve this. We need a, a road in order to get the telescope up the mountain or at least that's our first thought. We have to get the, get the telescope up the mountain. So here's an example of an alma dish being moved to the Atacama Desert on a massive machine on a very flat road. And of course, on Kilimanjaro, you're going to have to do lots of switchbacks to get through the grade to the top. Now, this goes to Mwenzi Peak. We're not going there. But irrespective, a road cannot work. A road is uneconomical because you can't make money from a road. Um, it cuts trees down to go through the rainforest, therefore it's, un, it's vi environmentally unfriendly, not a big no-no, and of course, lastly, it's butt ugly, and it affects the aesthetic beauty of the mountain, which in turn affects the economy, because fewer climbers will take the route. Anyways, so road don't work, we got to find a way to get our telescope up this mountain. So this is a problem we got to solve, we can't build a road. The crazy idea, <laughs> and I'll tell you what it is, it's clear to get over the rainforest, we have to use a cable car rather than a road. And why this is a crazy idea, it's not crazy, it's grounded in, in pure fact. It's crazy because I'm proposing building a cable car system with hotels worth a billion dollars to build a $15 million telescope. That's the crazy part. But the idea is completely simple because a cable car solves my three issues. In fact, it actually makes the economy grow by a factor of 10 at least, okay? It, it doesn't affect the rainforest, so the environment's not being impacted particularly, or very much, and we can, this damn thing can be very attractive. So it actually improves the beauty of the mountain, or we can low sling it. So this solved the three issues, and and it was a crazy solution because I'm trying to build a $15 million telescope or whatever the price is of the telescope. This does it. Roads make no money. Cable cars generate tourism dollars. This project went from adventure tours, it went from a, a science project to a tourism project. We literally were rebranding the mountain from adventure tourism to leisure tourism. And I drew all of that knowledge from my business experience. So that's how I was able to dream up this silly solution, this crazy solution. I presented this idea. I told them this is crazy. My friends will tell you when I say that, I'm going to say something crazy. And, and basically they loved it and they went for it. But I was able to draw upon my experiences outside of astronomy in order to come up with this sort of a solution. And um, anyways, otherwise we'd just be building a road and we wouldn't be doing this project. So, you know, the project is going forward. They are doing site testing for the cable car. That has moved out of our project and given over to someone else. That's unfortunate. So we have to find a new solution. And even that one's even crazier than this one. I'm talking about using airships to lift the equipment and everything over the rainforest. But that's another story and there's already some excitement in the community to help me with that. So crazy ideas based on my business experience this time. The Kilimanjaro project 
was a crazy idea when I proposed a billion dollar hotel and cable car system just to build a 15 million dollar telescope or whatever the price of the telescope will be. Absolutely crazy. But it made sense economically, environmentally, aesthetically. And so whether it's crazy or not, it's reasonable and it's now happening. So crazy ideas come true. And that was one of my crazy ideas. This is a crazier idea. Now, I didn't think of astro mining. It's been around for some time. People have talked about it. NASA's beginning experiments on it. This video is courtesy of NASA, the NASA website, and it's a YouTube video. My crazy idea was build the planet. Take the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And if I was to collect all of those asteroids and put them onto Ceres, I could create a planet, probably a tenth the size of the Earth or a tenth the size of the Moon, I can't remember which, but all, nonetheless, it would satisfy the criteria of what defines a planet. It has to orbit the Sun and it has to have cleared out its orbital path. If I take all those asteroids and put it on Ceres, I've done just that, we've created a planet. So it is possible, not likely to occur, but it is possible. But astro mining will. And what I'm trying to say is, a lot of those asteroids, because of the, the Jupiter-Sun um, interaction gravitationally, it actually causes those asteroids to get kicked out of their orbit and they fly into the inner solar system and they could accidentally hit the Earth and cause a distinct extinction event. Likewise, there are near-Earth objects between us and the sun that also could do that. My point is, astro mining, we could mine those things out of existence. My crazy idea is not simply to build a planet, rather it's to mine out of existence, existence all of the dangerous objects that could literally wipe out life on Earth. And more importantly, give us a resource that we could use. We will need the exotic materials, the platinum products, the gold, the silver, uh, rare earths, etc., etc., etc. It's all in that asteroid belt. We could literally build a planet if we wanted to. We could. It's a crazy idea. We won't do it, but we should be astro mining. We should be converting those raw materials into useful materials that are not dangerous to the earth. And that is my craziest idea. I'm sure I'll come up with bigger ones yet, but to date, that is my craziest idea. And so, dare to dream big. Maybe dream bigger than crazy. Dare to dream big. Many articles have been written recently regarding where the, the next great trillionaires or the, fir next tri the first trillionaire will come from is likely astro mining. And here's an example. This is a half mile wide asteroid that people believe is worth about 3.5 trillion dollars, trillion pounds. Anyways, there's another one I know floating between Venus and Earth that's worth about 20 trillion dollars US. And these are targets for astro mining. And it won't be easy, obviously, because that thing will be like a nickel iron and then it'll have plat trace platinum in it. So could you imagine mining that in space? Zero gravity, you have microgravity around it, and you have no atmosphere, no water. So you're going to have to use some whole new techniques. That is the really cool thing about astro mining. But it's going to make people very wealthy. And that really is working in space. And that is what I dream about doing. This is some artist's imagination of creating a universe. Now that is dreaming big. The poor, hard-working graduate student in the distance being shouted at by his professor, supervisor. Note the excitement in the eyes of the student. The key to all, our, all of our dreams, all of them, and especially if you want one to become a reality, is you have to ground it in 
science. You got to ground it in fundamentals, whether it's business, science, doesn't matter what it is. It's got to be well grounded. Here's the testing of the mind of a genius, and it's a fail. Pretty deflationary. No, you can't just make it up. This is physics. That is the point. Ground your dreams in the fundamentals, and they'll have a greater likelihood of success. Crazy idea or not, a lot of people eventually will be working in space, doing what I would have wanted to have done, and I hope I still will be able to. But regardless, people will be living out my dream in the future. At least I think so. I'm pretty sure it will occur. And, and that is my crazy dream. And that is what I dared to dream as a young boy, thinking that I could work in space. Most of what I've thought of or imagined, whether it's you know, designing telescopes or suggesting a telescope on Kilimanjaro and finding ways to get it to happen, or even talked about astro mining, it's, it's largely the result of my experiences, how, where I grew up, how I grew up, what I've learned, where I've worked, the people I've met, the movies I've watched, everything, everything contributes to this. Everything contributes to the journey that I'm on. And, and that's what leads to my imagination. It's what helps me to develop my imagination. And it will always, I will always be developing my imagination. The same will be true for everyone out there. So in the end, dare to dream. It's really just that simple. Don't limit yourself. Find something bigger than you and make it happen. The JIRA Foundation will produce more videos like this. Please like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video.